uh, anyway, so uh, I would like to welcome you here to this uh, today's webinar from Neuro Rehabilitation in Technalia on uh, sensory feedback technologies for extended reality and prosthetics. Um, it is a pleasure. My name is uh, Thierry Keller and I'm together with Matthias Trabac uh, to give you this uh, webinar. Uh, the aim that Technalia has uh, put these webinars on is due to the COVID-19 pandemia. Um, we want still to keep contact to you and uh, with, uh, with these webinars uh, to stay in, in, in contact. So you will be allowed uh, to uh, ask questions um, but this will not go in an oral way in that system, but uh, you can put them into the chat. So during our presentation, you can already formulate these questions, put them in the chat, and then the last 20 minutes of, the, of that webinar will go through your questions and then provide you answers uh, to, to those uh, questions. Uh, can I have next slide, Matthias? So um, we will go through four parts in that presentation. So I will give you a first uh, overview about uh, electrical stimulation um, uh, in, in the first hand, mainly on sensory stimulation. Then we'll hand over to Mattia, who will um, introduce you our MaxSense uh, projects that we had and what are the different ideas, re, uh, developments and results. Then follow up with uh, the tactility project, which is a project to use sensory feedback in virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality uh, scenarios. And they also give you a short overview about a very new project that just has started uh, that is called Sixth Sense, where um, enhanced health monitoring with sensory feedback is the main, main topic. Next slide. Um, electrical stimulation is a technology where you can uh, activate on one hand muscles to get motor uh, responses or motor activity, but it is also a technology that can be applied to give you sensory feedback. So when you apply electrical current uh, over the surface of your body or through the, the skin, you activate uh, on one hand uh, sensory uh, signals, but also motor signals. The sensory signals are those that occur uh, before you get the remote response. So when we have a low, a, a weak uh, stimulation, then with this we can give uh, a sensory signals and we have developed a number of technologies uh, to use these sensory signals for um, uh, getting a perception about uh, what the prosthetic hand is doing um, or also uh, to give uh, feedback about uh, about force uh, and, and so on. So Mattia will go very much into detail about uh, these different cues that we can do with uh, the electrical stimulation. Uh, next slide. Um, in general, when we look uh, at the uh, electrical stimulation and what it does, so we have the different uh, organs uh, um, and receptors uh, in the body. So here in the hand, for example, you can see uh, four different type of, uh, of these, uh, of these uh, sensors so that uh, we then can activate with electric stimulation. What we can see here in the image is uh, basically the density where we can get from the different sensors. So as we have different densities, uh, different perceptions, and also because these sensors have different sizes, we can have a number of uh, activations of perceptions um, represented by using electrical pulses. So we can change the speed of the stimulation, we can change 
the amplitude of the stimulation and the depth of the stimulation and with this we get uh, different uh, reactions. Another point is also what is called the so-called two-point discrimination. So here you can see on the human body that uh, the perception that we get when we have two electrodes, um, as it was uh, shown before, very close together, then depending on where we are on the body, that distance that we can clearly dif differentiate between uh, one electrode that is activated or another electrode that is activated is, uh, is uh, quite variable. So you can see on the fingers that distance is really a few millimeters, whereas when we then go to the upper arm, it can be also centimeters um, of, of difference. And this has an implication, of course, in how we are applying uh, the electrical stimulation and you will hear more of that from Matja. So I will hand over now to Matja um, to talk to you about the, our uh, experience uh, and expertise that we could gain over the past years, uh, mainly with the uh, MacSense uh, um, uh, projects. Okay, thank you, thank you, Terry, for this introduction, and thank you all for for joining the webinar. Uh, I will try to give you the outline in the the continuation of this presentation of, of the first research that we did in the in terms of electrotactile feedback, and it was related to the prosthetics. This this, this was done through through what we call Maxens project. And what we aimed in this project was to design electrotactile stimulation to serve as a feedback channel for, for my electric prosthesis. But in a sense, the, the results that we had in these projects can be generalized and uh, are also very much uh, effective to, to this extended reality application. So please, all of you that came, came for this reason and that are more interested in this part, stay, bear, bear with us because all these uh, results we are relevant and at the end of the pre presentation, I will definitely put them in the context of these new projects that are in this in this other domain. So first, let's speak about the, the Maxens project and what was our main idea. Well, uh, my electric prosthesis today, they are basically amazing mechanical systems that offer many degrees of freedom and uh, they're in that sense very very close to what we have in science fiction but there are many shortcomings i mean these mechanical systems even though they are so sophisticated uh, they have uh, some so, some parts that are basically lacking a little bit and uh, those are related primarily to the control interface that is still not intuitive enough and that is basically not robust enough. And there is a lot of research today in, in this field trying to, to resolve this problem and to resolve these issues. And actually, um, for, from, from each year, there is a body of research, of research and of new methodologies in, in uh, my, my control of prosthesis. And also there are some, some novel, pro, no, novel products uh, aiming to resolve these things, but I guess there will be also plenty of more research to be done in this field. But this is not what I will talk today. I will talk about this other as aspect that is related to the lack of feedback. Uh, almost all modern myelectric prosthesis, even though being sophisticated as they are, they are mostly lacking any feedback. Some of them basically have only sim uh, simple tectors, so simple vibromotors offering very, very rudimental feedback. But even like this, even this rudimental feedback is something that is very beneficial actually to the to the wearer. Uh, why we believe that feedback is, is essential is primarily because this is actually a known fact that um, a lot of amputees uh, actually choose to abandon myoprosthesis for the fact that they are not providing any feedback and they, they would rather use the hooks basically that have that offer this mechanical feedback when they are, you know, like contracting it with the shoulders so they can feel this pressure rather than using this sophisticated myelectric hand. So in that sense, we wanted to overcome this and we wanted to investigate whether 
this electrotactile stimulation cannot uh, can be used as a channel and that can offer let's say higher higher or better uh, resolution of feedback but what we also wanted to ensure and we st <laughs> let's say we set our goal high we wanted to ensure that this feedback will allow the user to actually feel the prosthesis as a part of their own body so in that sense we decided to investigate whether we can incorporate not only sensor information regarding the force that is applied by the prosthesis, but also this proprioceptive information. So information of what is the basically the position of the of the hand uh, uh, to the user so that we can allow him to to know how how prosthesis is oriented uh, or what is happening in the prosthesis by not looking at it. And we believe that this can offer this additional connection uh, from the user with the with the myoprosthesis. And basically the first thing uh, that we wanted to do to achieve this was to investigate how we can how we can basically modulate the stimulation. So uh, what we had regarding the equipment is that we have this very nice multi-channel stimulator that um, stimulators that can offer a great number of channels. They can offer distributed stimulation and they can also, also offer great flexibility in terms of that we can control current to the very precise, let's say, level of 0 0.1 milliamps and that we can really, really modulate and control the, the sensations that the user will actually perceive when being stimulated with this system. And in the sense, the first thing that we wanted to experiment is whether this modulation this flexibility in modulation of stimulation parameters, so the stimulation frequency, pulse width and amplitude, whether like this we can actually ensure to get some specific sensations. Like Terry mentioned at the beginning, we know that there are these different um, sensory cells in the body and that they have a different stru structure and that in a sense, possibly we can, we can target specific cells and target specific sensations. And this is the first thing that we did in the MaxSense. First experiment that we did was related to user perception of stimuli. How this is influenced by stimuli location, by stimulation parameters, and basically how big is the variability in perception between the subjects. Uh, ideally, of course, we desire to have that irrelevant of the stimuli location. Certain parameters will give certain type of sensations for all subjects. However, through this study, it proved that this is not the case. Uh, here you can see basically on this uh, image, you can see the, how the users describe the sensations that they go, got uh, via electrical stimulation on different pads. And you can see that uh, subjects describe sensations as usually as vibrations, but also as tingling, tickling, itching, pressure, uh, uh, pinching and, and basic touch. But in a sense from this, what you can see, and maybe I can zoom in here, is that there is great variability. And uh, this is not only intersubject variability, it's not just that different subjects will differently describe. It, it, of course, this is subjective. But in a sense, from these percentages that you see, because this experiment was done, you know, like 10 times on each of the subjects, you can see that actually there are subjects that one time describe the sensation as, let's say, vibration, and the other time as tingling. And it's 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 actually very hard for a for a human to to really describe, to really express the sensation, and actually to remember this this description. And in that sense, we 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 actually came to notice that we cannot really do this reliably, that we cannot really target specific sensations, but instead we wanted to, to go a step back and to see whether we can use this, uh, whether we can uh, send the information by modulating some other parameters. So not to target the specific sensations, but to, to, to do through the some other specific stimulation parameters. And this led us to make a step back and make a series of tests. And they are all listed here and I will not go through this. Uh, hopefully, I mean, you can, you can go through the presentation and also uh, their publication, our previous publications on this, if you, you, you are interested. But this is something that was basically known from literature, but we wanted to confirm this hypothesis. Uh, 
And in the end, the conclusion that we got from all these tests is that the only two parameters or only three parameters, let's say that all subjects can clearly differentiate and where this uh, modulation will be clearly, clearly perceived by the subject is stimuli location, stimulation frequency and stimulation intensity. However, considering that intensity is also something that is subject specific, of course, that increase of intensity will be perceived as increase of intensity for all subjects, but uh, each subject will perceive this a little bit differently. We know that this is due to the basically the physiological pa parameters of the skin, let's say, but also it's psychological. So for, for some person, intensity is very, very high when for some other it can be very, very low when the sensation is basically more or less the same. So it's it's individual. So in that sense, we wanted actually to to extract intensity from from what we will use as a modulation for sending up, sending back the feedback and to concentrate on the stimuli location and frequency themselves. Uh, and in considering this, that we want to, to modulate the stimulation frequency in, in stimuli location, and considering that we know that for this specific application, and this is something maybe that is now not related to, to, to the other applications, but for this specific application, we knew that we actually aim to have this uh, feedback integrated into the prosthesis socket and that we don't have a lot of space inside. And this led us to design the, the electrode that you see here that is very, very simple. It's a ray electrode, but we uh, came to, to learn that the simple is, is good in this sense because it minimizes the required surface. And at the same time, we know that the, basically the nerves are stretching along the arm so that the resolution is the highest when you go circular around the, around the, around the arm. And in continuation of this study, we wanted to experiment so what resolution we can really offer with these uh, two types of feedback. So coding the information in stimulation frequency and in stimuli location. We developed a software, you can see here how, how this graphical interface looked, that allowed us to, to do these experiments. It allowed us to, 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 to test on, on uh, healthy subjects, but also later on amputees, in what is basically the resolution of this type of feedback. And speaking about frequency, it's important to note that frequency is basically uh, not linear. And uh, in that sense, uh, subjects can really clearly differentiate, for instance, the stimulation that is one or two hertz and the uh, stimulation that is nine, 99 or 100 hertz is basically impossible to differentiate. So it's, it's exponential, uh, this, this um, mapping. And in that sense, uh, considering this mapping, we designed the, the optimal, let's say, spread from 4 hertz to 100 hertz and divided this in uh, six discrete levels. And we wanted to experiment uh, what would be the uh, success rate in recognizing the, the specific sensation or the specific frequency. So in, in that sense, how, how, how well can the subject later use this as uh, information to recognize, to understand the message? And uh, here you can see the, the basically the results from this study. And but what, what, what is very clear to, to see from there is that subjects were able to identify five different frequencies with above 80 percent accuracy and four with, with above 95 accuracy. And this after very, very short training. So this was like only five minutes of reinforcement learning. So the specific sensation was presented to the subjects and all, all of these specific sensations were presented to the subjects and then later they were asked to recognize them after five, only five minutes of training. And 95% for four levels, even though four levels maybe now doesn't seem enough, please consider that this then is basically multiplied by the number of locations where you can present the, the feedback. So actually this uh, multiplexed uh, information will give you very, very high resolution, high bandwidth of information. And how it is multiplexed and how much information you can transfer through the spatial, uh, spatial coding, uh, you can see here. Here I can, I can show you 
uh, what I need to stress out, out is that we basically wanted to test two type of, types of electrodes. One is the common anode configuration and the other is concentric anode configuration. We believed a little bit more in this concentric anode configuration because uh, we thought that it will basically allow, allow the sensation to be more localized, but in a sense it proved to be more or less the same, which you can see from this graph. What is important to note also regarding the electrode design, and this is something in line with what Thierry mentioned at the beginning, is that they are basically uh, considering the just noticeable differences of two point discrimination threshold or two point discrimination thresholds that are somewhere close to one centimeter for the forearm, a little bit lower, let's say nine, nine millimeters. So uh, they both have the uh, distance, pet to pet distance that is above this, a little bit above this. So, so we were we we're very confident that the subjects will be able, uh, able to uh, differentiate uh, stimulation of two different pets on both of them. Now, the question is not whether they will be able to differentiate these sensations. We knew that they will be able to di differentiate all 16 pets on these electrodes, on both of these electrodes. But what we wanted to experiment is how much they can actually recognize. So it's actually a different question. It's not whether they can differentiate, it's how much they can actually remember after a short training. So if we later use this for a code coding, for expressing some, some information inside, whether they will be able to recognize this. And what we got through these results, you can see this on this graph, is that uh, we have a success rate that is above 90% for six locations and actually above 95% for four locations. Once again, this is after only short training that lasted about five minutes. Uh, five minutes of reinforcement learning and we have already something that can prove very, very useful. So four or six locations after five minutes that can be re reliably recognized. So at that point, we were very, very confident that we have something that can provide, let's say, high resolution, high bandwidth of information that can be transferred to the subject. Then the next stage for us was to experiment how can be how can this actually be used in prosthetics. So we wanted to use frequency and space, uh, spatial modulation to present force feedback from the from the prosthesis and to explore how force feedback can be used for prosthesis control. And in this sense, we designed the two coding schemes that would allow us to present force feedback via 15 level gradual increase. And you can see this uh, here on the bottom of the slide, you can see these two code coding schemes. Uh, and wh what is different between them is that uh, one is actually relying on mixed coding. So you have uh, five uh, spatial levels and three frequency levels for each of these spatial levels, adding up to 15 in total. And the other one is simple spatial coding. So you have 15 spatial levels. And from what I said before, it's clear that they can they will not be able to differentiate all, all uh, 15 of them. They will be able to differentiate, but they will not be able to really recognize. And in that sense, you can see here these graphs that present the confusion matrices. Uh, you can see the spread here for the spatial uh, for the spatial uh, feedback configuration. You can see that it's not as precise as this one that is the that is the mixed coding that relies on only five spatial levels, but three frequency levels for uh, three frequency sub levels for each of them. And we know that this is very precise because you can see here the results we got is that you have around 87 or yes, around 87% success rate in recognizing the exact information for these 15 levels. So we knew that we have basically the high bandwidth on information and we wanted to test how, how basically this can be used in prosthesis control. And in this study, uh, this is the setup that we used. We had basically the EMG amplifier, we had the real Michelangelo prosthesis and virtual hand that we used alternatively basically to, to be able to assess 
the basically what is the internal dynamics of real hand compared to something that is basically proportional uh, controller. And then uh, we had uh, um, we, we had this bo in both cases this controlled by the EMG and we had the feedback information that is basically the uh, force that is in this simulated hand basically estimated and in the Michelangelo hand it's something that is actually measured from the uh, prosthesis itself and this feedback in of force was sent back as the uh, information to the user in one case using the electrotactile stimulation and using one of these two coding schemes that I showed and in the other case use, using the visual feedback. What we wanted to test basically in this study is whether subject will be able to use this type of feedback information. And uh, there is plenty of results in this study and plenty of interesting results so I would invite all of you who, who are interested to read through this paper because uh, I cannot present all of them now. But the bottom line, most important conclusion from the st study is that the electrotactile feedback can indeed be used to control the real prosthesis and track the force in real time, which you can see here from this graph. You can see this uh, on the, let's say, B, uh, B graphic on the, the left. You can see the force tracking in real time using the electrotactile feedback. Of course, this is not as precise as visual feedback, and you can see this here, uh, uh, that there is significant difference, but we actually expected to have this. Our aim was not to provide something that is uh, on the same precision as visual feedback, because we knew, for instance, that visual feedback is continuous information. We have only 15 discrete levels. Well, maybe not only 15 is a lot, considering what, uh, how, how you, you are able to control. And we know that basically this, let, let's say, new modality of feedback compared to visual subject is much, much easier to, to, to relate to visual information. But in a sense, uh, it's clear that uh, subject is uh, being able to track the desired uh, force level. Uh, we got the very similar result rega regarding the other condition uh, that was um, uh, continuous grasping, but I will speak this uh, in uh, in the uh, I, I will explain this uh, in the next study uh, how this affects the continuous grasping and how 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 useful it can be for for basically practicing this type of of uh, prosthesis control. But uh, what is also important to note here, very relevant result is that actually there is no significant difference between the mixed and spatial coding. So even though we knew that we have higher precision with this mixed coding, it's clear that with spatial coding, where user cannot really recognize the exact but can know spatially more or less where he is, more or less what is the level of force, the error is never, you know, like two or three, 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 uh, uh, three variables higher. Uh, so in that sense, this was this was something that was a uh, very good result for us. So we knew that in the end, actually, these 15 levels of spatial feedback can be uh, can prove use uh, can be proved useful, considering the internal dynamics on, of the prosthesis, etc. So in the next study, once we confirmed that this type of feedback can be used for for, for prosthetic control, it was obvious question how much and can users really improve their grasping performance by using this type of feedback. So we designed a study where we inspected myocontrol in the routine grasping task in which basically user needs to grasp the object with a predefined level of force and the improvement of control due to short-term learning and closing the loop while electrotactile feedback was also something that we wanted to see, whether this performance can be increased by using the, the this type of feedback information. So you can see here some, this slide from the, or actually it's a video, from the, from the, from the study that we did on nine amputees. It was a longitudinal study. It consisted of uh, 
uh, four sets of uh, 60 gra grasping session or, uh, sessions over five days. And uh, I will explain to the results how this uh, was defined. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, from this slide, maybe it seems that the results are a little bit complicated, but I will try to simplify it as much as possible. And you can see here on the lower bar, on the x-axis, this is the, these are the days. So basically, it's already clear that there is, uh, uh, from day to day, there is improvement. This is mean absolute error. So in this sense, basically, when this is getting lower, that means that prosthesis control is getting better. So it's clear that from day to day, uh, persons, uh, these subjects that were involved in the study were able to, to improve, to improve their grasping performance. Furthermore, what you can see from this graphic as well, with this uh, asterisk on top of the graphic, you can see what is a statistically sig significant difference. And you can see actually that on the four day, they uh, improved their per performance significantly. And this basically showed that th there is this, what we call the lo long-term learning effect. So they're improving their prosthesis control uh, from day to day. Now you are probably say, okay, this is now clear, but what are these four bars? Well, as I said previously, this was in this study, we divided this in four sets of 60 gra grass in that each day. Uh, how and why? Well, experiment was designed that the user first pro controls prosthesis without any feedback. So we know open loop. And uh, in, then we, we provide user with feedback in the next two sessions. So next two sessions of 60 grasps, they have the electrotactile feedback and they can get the information of how uh, what is the force that they applied to the object while they were grasping it? And then in the last session, we take the feedback away from them. Why? Because we wanted to see whether or not there is also this imminent uh, short term learning, whether by applying this feedback, they already can improve their grasping performance. And this was also clear here on the on the right. You can see this averaged and you can see basically what is happening. Uh, there is always, once they control the prosthesis is all open loop, there is always this clear, uh, um, let's say, l less precision and more error in prosthesis control. But then immediately, as we provide feedback, they are already much, much better and significantly better, let's say, at least r results show this, statistics show this. And then in the end, in the last session, once we take the feedback away from their, them, they are still significantly better than what they uh, were able to do in the open loop at the start, which means that this uh, electrotactile feedback is also useful in this short term. It has this short term learning effect, meaning that the subjects will be able to much better control the prosthesis uh, immediately after applying the uh, tactile feedback, which is very relevant re result from us. So basically, this is the, this is now uh, combining the two most important uh, information for us. One was that uh, we knew after this study that the subjects can really rely to electrotactile feedback in controlling the prosthesis. And the other is that by using electrotactile feedback throughout time, their performance can really improve. So this, the, the, this, these were very relevant results for us. But then we come to actually the fun part, to the most interesting part related to the uh, electrotactile feedback modality. And this is something that is, let's say, the greatest advantage to, to some of the other feedback modalities is that actually we can use this uh, spatial and frequency modulation separately to send multimodal information to the uh, to the user. Um, we wanted, and this is basically the the goal that we set at the very beginning that I mentioned, and it seemed a little bit high. We wanted to uh, enable user to feel the prosthesis as a part of their own body, and we wanted to 
convey proprioceptive information as well as this for force feedback. And for this pur purpose, we have designed, I would say, very, very clear intuitive coding schemes uh, through these dynamic stimulation patterns. And I can explain this best uh, uh, through this uh, video that we have. This is, uh, let's say, Maxen's promo video that we made. And I will not go through, 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 through the beginning of the video because it, it basically shows uh, the, the idea, the concept that I already described. So how the user without feedback is not so proficient with, with the use of the prosthesis because he is not able to tell what is the force that he is applying, etc. And then we have basically designed this type of uh, electrotactile feedback that should allow him to get this type of information. But this is now important. Uh, the coding schemes that we designed to be intuitive that should allow the user to feel it as the part of their own body. So think about this now. This is our electrode inside of the prosthesis socket. Uh, I hope that the video now works and that it's not really, uh, <laughs> there are no delays because there is now the, basically in the video, there, there, there are these, um, uh, basically <laughs> the, the, the things being lit up and, 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 uh, and, and turned off uh, that are explaining actually what is happening. So going back to the aperture, we wanted to make this uh, information intuitive. So you can see here that this information is coded that when the hand is closing and the fingers are getting closer together, basically the stimulation is getting closing, closer together. The same way when it's the fingers are getting apart, the stimulation is getting apart. These pa active pads are getting further away from each other. Similarly, when the hand is rotating, the Stimulation is rotating around the arm. You, you can see here in the, in the example of when the hand is fully open. But similarly, you, and this is what is very interesting, is that these two are actually decoupled. So in a sense, you can half close the hand, these two will come closer together, and then it, rotation will be coded in the same way, which you can see now in this video. Basically, hand is half closed, the, the uh, the um, basically these two active pads are uh, further away from each other, but the rotation is still coded by the rotation, which is very nice, which makes it very, very much intuitive. But what is the most interesting is this part of feedback that is the force feedback that is actually now coded in the frequency, which is completely now decoupled from, from, the, from the stimuli location. However, hand is opened or closed, stimulation frequency is stimulation frequency. And this allows us basically to present this information simultaneously, which means that the, when subject is grasping an object, basically when the object is being squished, this stimulation that is now basically increasing the frequency due to applied force will result with the change of the position so that the subject can tell whether or not the object was being crushed or, or not, which we found to be very, very, uh, very, very, very helpful to the to the to the prosthesis users. Okay, we don't need to watch this video, but I will invite you all to to watch it because we have much better narrator than me on for this film and, and uh, very very clear explanation of all the messages. And what we did then is we basically wanted to to really confirm that this uh, type of dynamic stimulation pattern patterns can be recognized by the amputees. And we did this study on six amputees. And uh, similarly, as when we tested stimuli location and frequency identification, uh, there was only a short couple of minutes of reinforcement learning before testing whether or not they can really understand the feedback message. So the feedback messages were whether the hand is being opened or closed, whether it's being rotated in pronation or supination, or and whether the force is being increased or decreased, and whether there is the uh, flexion or extension of the hand, because this is what we found out to be, for instance, the what is in the latest latest version of uh, Michelangelo prosthesis that we used as basically the reference. Of course, we 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 would be able to define a little bit different coding schemes from for for, for different prosthesis, but more or less 
the rotation and ap aperture and the force is something that would be, let's say, aligned for, for, for most of them. What we got as a results, and this is what is very interesting, is that uh, the subjects were indeed able to very confidently uh, recognize the, 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 this dynamic stimulation patterns and to understand the message that was presented to, to them. Uh, this confusion matrices that you see on the on the slide is from, from the study on six amputees. They were very good, but there was still a significant difference compared to able-bodied subjects that had 99% 99 success rate. But for us, this was basically, we believe that this is due to the age difference primarily. I mean, amputees were, most of them were older, a little bit older, and it after this short training, maybe they weren't that able to understand all the things that we wanted to 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 code through these messages and to really relate to what is happening with the prosthesis. But bottom line, and this is how I would conclude the the things related to the to the prosthesis use of electrotactile feedback is that we showed that amputees can really differentiate these dynamic stimulation patterns. So in that sense that the electrotactile feedback can be used to present multimodal information. So inf information about multiple degrees of freedom of the prosthesis, which is very nice because now, as I said, this modern myelectric prosthesis is very sophisticated, but they don't provide any feedback. We wanted to provide as much feedback as possible. And we showed that uh, this type of feedback can be used to present not only force feedback, but multiple uh, proprioceptive information at the same time. One, that, that was one thing. The other thing that we knew is that uh, they can use it in prosthesis control to improve, to improve the force that is being applied by the prosthesis. And we knew that they can actually improve over time. So these three conclusions from, from, from what we did in the uh, prosthesis uh, uh, application actually led us to believe that this is actually also very, very useful, can be very, very useful for other applications. And like this, we came to idea to use the same modality for something completely different. To use basically the electrotactile feedback to, to, to incorporate it into the virtual reality, let's say, to uh, encompass also tactile information into the modern virtual reality systems that usually comply or are related to only visual and auditory information. And uh, uh, we had a strong belief uh, after what we achieved and the results we obtained from Accents that uh, this stimulation and this type of dynamic stimulation patterns can be used to produce something that is Let's say not. It, it it can never be the same as natural touch, but we can we we can strive to get it to feel as much as possible re real as much as possible, and uh, in that sense we also knew that for instance in this virtual reality when this is coupled together with visual and auditory information, this can prove to be very much beneficial in the for for many applications and we envisioned these two as primarily let's say primarily uh, demo cases inside of the tactility project one is to have this inside of this vr or ar or mr uh, environment where this uh, is incorporated into the tactile glove so what we know and what Thierry also mentioned at the beginning is that the resolution that we can achieve on the fingertips as the let's say the most uh, the part with most tactile sensors is uh, will be much uh, we, we will allow us much denser or much higher bandwidth of information that we can send to the user and uh, we wanted to couple this together with this uh, virtual reality gloves that are currently being used kinematic gloves and we have a very nice uh, partner in this project, Manus VR, which, which is one of the, or, or maybe probably the best producer of these these types of, type of gloves. 
and uh, to couple this with also something some interesting applications that can be also i mean in in some type of gaming or or uh, other interest uh, or or other let's say more le leisure oriented um, applications but also in in terms of industry in terms of uh, providing information and uh, for learning and training of different type of uh, um, uh, different type type of let's say uh, manual jobs in, inside of virtual reality. And th this is one of the applications. And the other application that is also very re relevant is basically this telemanipulation scenario in which this type of tactile glove can be used to pre present the information back from some robotic uh, system. So robotic system, sensorized robotic system, and we have a uh, University of Genoa now developing this type of sensors that we can put on the uh, artificial hand to measure this tactile information that we want basically then to send to the to the user who is uh, being a, uh, who, who we want to enable to feel this on a, let's say different part of the planet. So this telephone manipulation scenario, I guess, is now very very relevant due to the recent crisis and situation, but OK, I will not go into that. Uh, I want only to show you because this is a project that started uh, less than a year ago, so we don't have too much results and papers are, are being written currently, and so we, we, we don't want to de de disseminate too much now. But uh, what we had is one uh, workshop, and hopefully this will work now. Or not? Yes, it will. Okay. Um, so we we made one workshop. Our partner Immersion, which is basically now currently one of the European lead uh, lead um, uh, lead uh, industry partners for developing the the. Is this working or not? It's working. Uh, uh, Okay. Uh, uh, they 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 are designing this basically graphical interfaces or user interface interfaces of many kinds, also for virtual reality, and they they made one very interesting application that is allowing users to feel the movement of certain virtual objects on top of these uh, fingertip electrodes that we designed previously, and now we are experimenting with them, uh, uh, what users can perceive, how, how much different information can be uh, transferred via this, uh, via this channel, etc. And you can see here how this workshop looked like with, where, where users were able to test this. But message to take home, you saw that those fingertip electrodes, uh, users are really able to differentiate each separate pad on those electrodes and now we are thinking about the clever coding schemes in which this will actually user can perceive this as a uh, sense of touch of, of touching the object in the most let, let's say most natural way and the other current project that actually just started this month is six sense and it's uh, also very very interesting and very promising application it's a application in which we want to make basically enhanced health monitor and you know all this you know like health monitoring devices that currently exist on the market starting with these smart watches etc and they provide let's say significant information but uh, what we want is to make this much much better uh, by incorporating uh, electrochemical sen novel electrochemical sensors that can measure level of lactate, level of cortisol, etc., and also some novel um, um, decision support system to integrate all this multimodal sens sensor information to assess the level of stress or fatigue of first responders deployed in actions. So, so basically. Uh, this is something that is very much relevant to, to this specific application, but it can be also looked outside of this first responder uh, first responder use of, of feedback. But what is very interesting here is that we want to close the loop in the same manner. We want to allow tactile feedback uh, 
that will be very, very similar to what we did in Maxens in something that will be basically the uh, arm bracelet uh, on the lower or the upper arm or something that will be in a vest. This is something that we are still, you know, like project started only this month, so we are discussing how we'll uh, design this the, this feedback channel and the overall device. But in a sense, this, this is the idea and moreover is that actually we want to present not only the continuous information about the health, health information of the wearer of the device, but we also want to incorporate this uh, 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 telemanipulation scenario in which the users uh, or the command center is actually controlling the complete team deployed in action and also transferring back the information or, or uh, sending these discrete messages to basically optimize these resources. So this is all from my presentation. I hope that it was interesting and that you got to understand a little bit better what is this electrotactile feedback, why we believe in this so much, and why, why we also made European Commission to believe in this to, to finance two projects in the last year. But uh, uh, now, I mean, if you have any questions, I think that uh, now the floor is open to, to questions, so I will ask Thierry now to to yeah to to start reading the questions that we got so far thank you all okay thank you Mattia uh, you can also add me to the screen please it's either me or, or you Thierry uh, now so you I... you are live so you can switch to showing. yeah I will switch um, okay perfect Okay, so we received during the presentation, we received a number of questions that uh, now we can go through them and give you uh, answers to, to those. So I start uh, chronologically. So the one question was, uh, how focal is the stimulation? So is it possible to stimulate specific neurons in the nerve? So I can take this uh, question um, I mean, what we cannot do is really to go to one specific neuron when we do the electrical stimulation. But when we are talking about the different receptors, then what we know is when we do electrical stimulation, when we increase the intensity, we get deeper into deeper structures. That's number one. And number two is that we activate uh, smaller nerves. So when we um, have a, a, a weak stimulation, then we have the most superficial um, um, nerves that we can activate or organs that we can activate. And then progressively we can go deeper. Um, and with that, we then can give these different types of sensation that is a, like a superficial um, uh, with a low frequency um, uh, that is like a superficial type of, uh, of, of tingling towards a more deeper sensed uh, um, vibration type of, of, of sensation. But we can also have on the uh, bare nerve endings um, with uh, a high intensity uh, something that is not that comfortable because it goes in the direction of a dull uh, pain sensation uh, because then we have uh, activated more the nociceptive uh, um, parts um, in, in, our, in our skin. Um, but what we are doing now in these projects is more on the tingling side than on the vibration side and to give some sensation of, of, a, of a very light touch feeling that we can do by having a low frequency combined with uh, very uh, with a high a high frequency combined with a very low amplitude, and then as we can move from one electrode to the other, we can give this uh, type of of caressing uh, um, uh, perception. Another question was um, how many different stimulation patterns per second can be done and how much data can be transmitted per time unit? So maybe uh, you want to take this one, Matja? 
Yes. Well, uh, stimulation patterns are basically, I mean, stimulation patterns represent the, the movement. It's basically the coding scheme. So in a sense, idea is that uh, as fast as the prosthesis is, for instance, closing or rotating, uh, this is the, 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 let's say, how fast we want to present the stimulation pattern. Now, if the question is, if the question is how um, uh, much information or how fast we would uh, allow the, the prosthesis to move so that the uh, user can perceive this info information, uh, we are stimulating uh, in a range from 10 to 100 hertz. So basically 10 is when what we use to code the lowest force and 100 to the highest force. And so in a sense, if the prosthesis is completely clo clo closed in, uh, I don't know, then 50 milliseconds, then of course we will, we will uh, user will not be able to perceive all these levels of closing. But uh, the, the, the idea is that user is able to track what is happening with the prosthesis. So at least he will be able to feel the, the, uh, the movement. Uh, Thierry, did I miss one part of the question? This was the first part and there was also the other part. Yes, no, that's, uh, that are two parts. A third part uh, was also in that question um, about the limitations uh, that, that things can be uh, recognized by the brain. So there it's uh, really, I mean, we get uh, the signal stimulation that is the tingling and then due to a higher frequency, we get this fusion where we cannot anymore distinguish one to the other stimulation. There is another question that is more from the practical side. Uh, so what is the minimum amount of uh, electrodes needed to be able to deliver some useful information, for example, for prosthesis control? And how much of the skin area does it take? Uh, I think we have seen in the video more or less uh, the, the answer to, to this. So, I mean, it's not a big part of the area that is uh, taken um, and we can give uh, useful information, for example, with 16 electrodes uh, on, uh, on this uh, rotation movement uh, that is prosupination. Um, and uh, I mean, the minimum amount of electrodes are two because we need to close uh, the, the loop for the current or the current path. So we need to have an entry point and an exit point of the, of the current. Then um, another question is uh, from Jared Jobs. Uh, um, is there a desensation over prolonged wear time? So Mattia? Yes, uh, sorry, I'm just, uh, yes. I, I got this synced with these uh, videos that I'm sending, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, well, of course there is habituation effect and this is clear, but what we aim and what is the idea is that the stimulation is not constantly active. The stimulation is active only when the prosthesis is moving and this is the, the general idea and this is the general principle that we also do in tactility. So, User grasps the objects, he can feel when the object is being grasped, but it's, there is no need to stimulate him constantly. It's, it's, it's to perceive what is the level of force that is being applied. Then when, when the prosthesis is not exerting additional force, there is no need to continuously stimulate to tell him this is the force, this is the force. So that's the idea. The habituation can be avoided in this way. Okay, let's take uh, one uh, last uh, question here because we are running out of time but then we will answer um, here also the other questions in 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 written um, so the question comes from from dario how durable are prosthesis in use regarding the sensitive parts any experience so far on malfunctions Is it for me, Thierry? Yes, I, I think okay. so. Well, uh, the current status is that we have this uh, Maxens electrotactile stimulation as a separate device. Our idea is to integrate this into prosthesis and to test this over the prolonged usage 
of course, this would be ideal to have this type of result. So far, we don't have this type of results because uh, everything that we tested, I mean, we are a research center. It's clearly we are we are doing the research and uh, we didn't uh, really commit to any prosthesis. We, we had used Max, uh, Michelangelo prosthesis in this specific study, but then this would be very much related to the prosthesis itself and then the, all the elect combination of electronics would depend on the on the let's say prosthesis manufacturer. This is actually ideally the add on to some commercial existing prosthesis. But in a sense, if the question is regarding the stimulation system itself, it's very, very durable. And uh, there is also this question of whether or not this type of electrodes uh, are envisioned to be in the final design. They don't necessarily need to be. Uh, I think that you saw in one of the first slides that I showed that we also played a little bit with the, the interface and the electrodes themselves. They can be on different materials. We, we use this simple PET foil and uh, we use the hydrogel as an interface, which would not be ideal for the prosthesis, but we played a little bit with conductive rubber, so this can be uh, manufactured in some, some other fashion that is also once again uh, aligned with the socket, the production of the socket of the prosthesis itself. So in this sense, the ones that we have currently, we know that they are, they are very durable, but they are they will probably not be in the end product, in the end design of the that that is intended to be worn over, over time. But we know that these are very durable because we use them in, in the clinical studies in a different um, um, in a different uh, um, topic. So for neurorehabilitation, for uh, gra gra grasp exercise, or for drop foot, we use them over, over a couple of months. Actually, they can still work. Hydrogel is the only thing that would need to be changed. Okay, thank you, Mattia, very much for giving us here the overview about all the different applications that we got uh, experience in Technalia using um, sensory stimulation. I would like to thank to all that were here during the webinar, listening to our webinar. Uh, there will be more webinars uh, produced uh, during the next weeks uh, from Technalia. So we will follow up and we will answer the other questions that have been posed but now could not be broadcasted live. So thanks for being here with us and have a good uh, afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you all. And please feel free to contact us. You have the emails here on the uh, yeah on the on the on the last slide. So yes, any questions that you have, any interest in this application of other application of electrotactile feedback, we will be happy to to answer. And a last notice. So this webinar will be published. So within uh, one week, you will be able to also uh, go on the uh, YouTube channels to get that uh, webinar. So to show to others uh, that are interested. So let's stay in touch and have a good time. Goodbye. Thank you.